Okay, welcome to another episode on the podcast for affordable housing and real estate investing. Today, we have Dylan Everso. He is from the Tampa area, but he has multiple Section 8 investments in the Midwest. We're so happy to welcome him on. Today, I got my guest co-host, Dane. What's going on, buddy? How are you doing? Great, Ken. Great, great, great. I love, love it. Love being and here, then, man. I you love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm so happy. You and I get along so well, and I'm I'm really excited to see where this kind of goes on for the podcast. Um, just to have your experience and your wealth of knowledge coming on here, I think that's going to make these conversations really, really fruitful. Yep. So without further ado, Dylan, welcome to the show, man. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how did you get into affordable housing? Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, so I got started in real estate about six years ago as a real estate agent was fairly unsuccessful you know i was like 19 um kind of the the marketing book that they have for realtors is just to kind of call your friends and family and see who's selling so um i was calling my buddies in dorm rooms asking if they were going to be buying real estate soon and i just i, I never got the skills needed to be very good at it um so did that for a couple of years um kind of found a niche within helping investors buy properties um so i was able to pick up a little bit of momentum um through that just being able to find a good distressed property that I could, it was almost like wholesaling, but as a real estate agent. Um, so if I could create value through finding, you know, distressed properties or motivated sellers, selling them to investors and then, you know, repping them on the sales side as well. Um, you know, that was kind of a niche that I, I was able to, to start to get momentum in as a, as a real estate agent. Um, so I started doing that to pick up momentum and then started branching out to do my own fix and flips and then uh, kind of fell into the niche of, um, affordable housing as well, just from most of the areas that I was working in, and then leveraged my fix and flips into the rental portfolio I have now. So it was kind of one thing that led to another, but um, yeah, that's how I got started in affordable housing. Yeah, that's that's cool, man. That's cool. So that's how you got started in affordable housing. You used the profitability from what single family flips to then bankroll your multifamily property. Is that is that the way you did it then? Yeah, exactly. So um, I was looking only on the MLS. I wasn't doing anything direct to seller. Um, as a real estate agent, that's all you learn, really. It's just, you know, look through the MLS, see what's on there, see what type of deals you can get. Um, so I was looking for as many, um, you know, properties that were looked over by traditional investors. Um, so typically the, the properties that are in a little bit rougher areas might have tenant issues that would prevent, uh, you know, people from going in and doing it either remotely or some that wasn't experienced, you know, if you have a tenant that's not paying rent, it's a little bit of a rougher area and it has foundation damage. Um, your average investor isn't going to want to take on, you know, all three of those problems in one property. Um, so I started seeing those type of assets sit on the MLS for extended periods of time. Um, so those were the ones that I was able to kind of go in. One of my first properties um, that I did um, in like a CD grid neighborhood was um, all three of those issues. It was a little bit of a rougher area. Um, tenants were, I would say six or seven months behind on rent. And it was during COVID when you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be able to evict anybody. Um, so, you know, those are the type of, of, uh, properties I started to take on that were on the MLS for a while, um, kind of built out that niche, um, and then just kept rolling my profits into to next deals. And then, um, you know, as of beginning of 2021 started doing more, uh, rental properties, for long-term cash flow with Section 8 tenants and, and things like that. So just continually rolling profits and, and working in those areas is kind of you know how I got my start and to, to build up my portfolio. So you rolled that pretty quickly then, just like a, what, two years-ish of doing fix and flips? Or is it longer than that? Did I not do the yeah. math? It would be math on the program today. And I sorry. No, that was good math. <laughs> it was just over two years. Yeah, that's um, was awesome. when I bought my first fix and flip. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, basically try to roll everything I possibly could. Um, a lot of it was just trial and error, especially my first couple flips were, were pretty rough, rough. A lot of uh, mistakes were made, but um, just kept rolling it, kept at it. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it worked out. I, you know, I was able to, to roll into a portfolio uh, for long-term rentals, which was nice um, because there's, you know, there's less heavy lifting. Right. Something I didn't love about the fix and flips just from a, you know, a personality standpoint was, you would always have to go out and flip the house to make that income. But if you didn't flip it, you know, the next quarter, you didn't have another property, you know, next year that you were going to be flipping, then the income stopped. So having that as my only source of income, 
right. um, was not, you know, sustainable for me. Um, so being able to roll those into the rentals I have now is definitely, you know, a big one. And I'm super, you know, I'm super blessed to be in that position. Yeah. Uh, my brother and I uh, just on a personal note, we've, we're fairly established on the multifamily side, um, but we're kind of reverse engineering it from what you did. We're actually now looking like, okay, we're always, we're creatives. We're always looking to grow and do things. And so, you know, we've talked with Ken about short-term uh, rentals uh, in niche markets and in niche spaces, but also doing fix and flips just for additional capital and and for the experience and, and to learning. So, yeah, that's cool. I may I may uh, I may bring you back on and pick your brain on just that topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I have you know, there's people that are always kind of reaching out, you know, asking about how to get started in real estate and stuff. And I feel like the main narrative is to like just drop everything, quit everything, just start like you know, flipping properties or wholesaling doing, you know, they kind of like, it's all or nothing. Um, but I think that's underrated, you know, either having a W2 or having like a rental portfolio to sustain you while also building like active income streams, I think is the way to go. That's smart. Yeah. Love it. Dylan, so where are your investments currently? What markets are they in? And how many units do you have? And how did you pick those markets? Give us a little bit of background because we have a lot of new people listening. And just like you said, like people ask you where to get started. They're like, wow, how does this Dylan guy pick his markets? So tell us a little bit about your portfolio, where you're investing and why'd you pick those markets? Yeah, so when I got started, I did all my fix and flips in the Tampa Bay area. Um, you know, it's where I live. That's where I could manage it. Um, as things fell apart, which they often did. Um, I was able to go out to the properties and, and, you know, see things for myself and meet contractors out there just made it, you know, a lot simpler. Um, as I started getting more comfortable um, and I went from doing fix and flips to picking like long-term markets for cash flow, um, I started comparing the uh, fair market rents. So the HUD FMRs is what they're called um, from the, um, I don't know exactly. It's like HUD.gov slash FMRs or something like that. Um, but the average rents uh, against the average purchase price in areas. And I found favorable ratios in the St. Louis and the Cleveland area. So I have eight units right now in St. Louis, Missouri, and then I have 13 units in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I got my first uh, like out of state rentals in St. Louis, um, just because that was, a, that was kind of the first market that I, I found where it made more sense in Tampa for um, like I had a property that I sold in June of 2022 and it was running for 2250 and I ended up selling it for 265. So for a normal deal that I typically see in Tampa, your monthly rents are about 0.8% of whatever the purchase price is. Um, and St. Louis, I was getting like 1.4%, 1.5%. So I was almost getting two times the rent for whatever the purchase price would be, which especially starting out gave me a, a good buffer for, you know, any, any trial or error um, or tuition as, as Dane would say um, to kind of go through those uh, learning experiences and gives you a little bit extra buffer. So um, I picked St. Louis first and then I picked Cleveland for the same reason um, because now I'm getting about 2% of the um, rent to purchase price. So for every hundred thousand dollars, I typically buy in like a duplex or a single family. I'll get about um, you know two thousand dollars in rent for that. So those were those were what I initially looked for uh, those markets. I didn't look too far into uh, Section Eight wait lists or anything like that, mm -hmm. um, just because almost in every area across the country there's waiting lists and waiting lists for uh, people trying to get those available units. Um, but both St. Louis and Cleveland have mm -hmm. huge waiting lists um, that have been closed for years in a lot of circumstances. Um, and a lot of people that just need affordable housing units that are are willing to lease it out to people that are on those programs. And Dylan, I love that. Let me make sure I pause and make sure the audience understood what you talked about, about the percentages, right? Yeah, that's So great. what you did, and this is, I love it because this is exactly what I did. And for the longest time, I didn't talk to anyone. I was like, hey, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Am I going crazy? So what you did was you went to the federal HUD website uh, and you took the monthly FMR, the fair market rents. You took that and you multiplied that by 12 and then you divided it by the average sales price, right? I want to make sure I, I explained that correctly for the audience. Did I explain that correctly based on how you did it? Yes. Yep. That's perfect. Awesome. <laughs> and I want the audience to make sure they catch this because sometimes we just say, hey, go get started. Just start calling. You can use a little thought 
uh, apply a little bit of thought process towards it. So you don't have, just have to start calling. You got to find the areas that are most likely to cash flow so you can actually make your investment sustainable. So that's a really, really great uh, method or a strategy for the listeners to employ. It's like, just go to the HUD website, get the fair market re uh, rent, multiply by 12 and divide it by sales price and look for the same ratios that Dylan just went through because that is how you can narrow down your search really, really quick. So you can be more of a sniper instead of just like a machine yeah. gun, like spraying it all over the place. Dan, anything to add from your side? No, that's I, <laughs> as you were talking, I was actually making a note of that. That's, you know, this, that's why I'm here. Like I want to learn too is, and so I'd made a note of that and I'm going to compare you know, all of our properties and the rents uh, on that uh, and use that as a little tool in the tool belt uh, moving forward for sure, for sure. Um, so you got started in affordable housing just because of the upside then it sounds like with the upside of, of the, the flips and then and then you kind of figured out the the math here on 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 everything and, and that's what led you, that's what led you here. Why, why affordable housing instead of like an A class or a B class? Yeah, I mean, getting my start, my start was really as a real estate agent looking only on the MLS, trying to find properties that everybody just overlooked or didn't want to deal with because of the management side. Um, so like in Tampa, okay. there's parts of Tampa, like in Ebor and kind of like sub neighborhoods like yeah. that, um, where being in those areas would just be like a strike against it or is only like a certain type of investor. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I just started doing a lot more work in those types of areas um, just because I felt like they were overlooked <laughs> returns. And then after my first two properties there, I just saw the demand yeah. Um, yeah. for even for like fix and flips. So like when I was doing my fix and flips, um, thinking of my end buyer in like a C, D grade neighborhood was if I, my, you know, my future buyer is going to be on an FHA program. They're going to be on a VA program, something that is, you know, government backed, something that is, um, low down payment typically. So when I would renovate the properties, I would put way more emphasis in making sure it could pass one of those inspections. Um, yeah. So we wouldn't have any red flags versus like, you know, the odds of someone buying a $150,000 house, but putting 20% down is a lot lower than people that are looking to put three and a half percent down, you know, with the FHA program. For sure. So I would renovate them a lot more with that in mind than I did necessarily things like stylistically or layout because if someone's trying to buy their first house and you know that's what they're approved for then they need that inventory they need those fha approved uh, one hundred fifty thousand dollar houses for them to live in and whether you picked a great paint color on the walls or an average paint color on the walls yeah. you know it's something they can go in and just change sure. um so i saw the demand that was on the back end of that just being in a level of affordability with still having a quality product um, and was able to have some success early on through that type of strategy um, that then when I converted to long-term rentals, um, it was kind of an easy switch because, you know, there's still e even more demand with people that have government housing vouchers versus people that are FHA approved that are in a certain price bracket. Um, so it was, it was a great transition between the two. And I think there was a lot of things I was able to pull um, from one to the next, especially without like, over improving, you know, making it, having a huge right. focus on safety and functionality um, without going broke, trying to make things, you know, trendy or anything like that, um, yeah. just because it's not needed. And the, and the people that do value that when they move in, they go make it their own and add, add their own personality to it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was something I really, it, as I saw that pent up demand, it was something I just wanted to continue to invest in. And it felt like I was going, you know, towards the momentum of that market it wasn't something that i was trying to um you know build a class in a c class neighborhood or do anything right. that might have been you know <laughs> counterintuitive to those types of markets yeah i love two things there um number one you saw the need and there's so much need it, it almost it always makes me when i'm in one of those neighborhoods looking at a property it makes me wish i had like a billion dollars so i could just buy up the whole block or two blocks or three blocks and, and do everything. But most importantly, I, I think what you, what you said is you, you stayed on a budget, you made it affordable for these people. It's real easy to get carried away with granite countertops and a, a swimming pool and a whatever. And before you know it, that hundred and a quarter, $150,000 home is now three, four, 500,000. And you price yourself out of the neighborhood and subsequently out of any profits, you, you know, you may even lose. So that's great. 
talking numbers, if you don't mind, let's do a deep dive, as Kent likes to say. I want to do I want to hear from you on two deals. One, uh, you can you can brag a little bit like, hey, this was the best deal I ever did in terms of what I paid for it, uh, what I put into it in terms of renovation. And now what I'm making on rents or a flip in your in your case, in some of those situations. But also, I, I want you to uh, strip down naked here, and, and not literally, but and, and, and tell us the bad story, you know, the, the worst deal that you've done and, and what went wrong there. Was it an oversight on your part? Was it COVID? And, and kind of share the, the, the ugly numbers on, on, on the bad deal, too. Yeah, so probably the best deal I did, I made six figures on a flip um, that went wow. from a property that I bought that was distressed. I fixed it up. I rented it out for a year and then I you know, sold it for a six figure profit. Wow. Um, but that was another, uh, it, it was my second property that I ever purchased and I purchased it as a three one in Tampa, Florida and paid 75,000 for it. And it was on the MLS for almost a year, which is crazy. Nobody wanted this house. Um, it had major foundation damage. It had a tenant that hadn't paid in several months. And it was in a little bit of a rougher area, but it was truly transitioning. Um, so I purchased it for 75,000. I went and talked to the tenant and said, hey, I know you haven't been paying rent, but you know, once they left this eviction moratorium, you know, you're gonna get evicted. It's not good for you, it's not good for us. It costs everybody money. It hurts your record. You're not gonna be able to get a new place. I um, was able to have a good conversation with them and gave them two grand cash and they left within three days. Um, so I was able to get the tenant out. Uh, we got several bids for foundation work from all the way up to $90,000 uh, just for the foundation. And my budget for the rehab was about 75 grand. Yeah. So uh, we were able to kind of work with an architect and a structural engineer to pick through what was necessary and what wasn't necessary. Uh, we got the foundation bid all the way down to about 15,000. Um, just doing what was necessary. Um, you know, nothing. We weren't trying to rebuild the house. We were just trying to make it safe to where everyone could sign off on it. Um, city would approve our permits. Um, it would be good for, you know, decades to come. Um, so we did that. We spent about another 60 grand on the rest. So we were all in about 150,000. And then we got a tenant in at 2250. Um, they lived in it for a year, um, just under a year. And then um, I ended up selling it for 265. Um, to somebody that just wanted the cash flow and, and thought it was a good deal. Um, we did go, I definitely spent more on repairs than I would typically with a long-term rental, um, which kind of made me want to sell it instead of hold it for a long, a long period of time, just because I, I almost over-improved the property. Um, but that was probably the best deal. But through that, you know, I had, I had tenants. Uh, when I initially bought it, we sent an inspector to the property. We got it approved by everybody, right? The listing agent knew. Um, they told the tenants, everybody was on the same page. This inspector was going to the property and he pulled into the driveway and the tenants came out of the house and started beating on the guy's windshield, trying to get him to leave, being like, you can't be here. Like they, cause they weren't paying rent. They thought they were going to get out. So we basically had to come back. You can hire the police. I don't know if you know about this, but all local police, uh, police stations have like a, um, I don't know if it's considered like third party or what but they have like extra duty that the police officers can do. And you submit an application. It takes like a couple weeks to get approved. Um, but we actually paid to have two police officers and two separate police cars come out to the property to escort the inspector through the inspection so he could do his job. So everyone, like I've had great experiences with tenants, but every once in a while you will get a tenant like that where you kind of got to go overboard to protect either, you know, the people that are working with your company or, or you yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, they were great when I went out to talk to them to, um, give them the cash for keys. Um, you know, they were great. Um, they were able to talk to me and they ended up getting out in three days and that whole project was, was pretty profitable. Um, there was one time it was vacant while I was trying to get a, a tenant in there and someone busted in through the side window. So I put, I put stainless steel appliances. They were used, but they're stainless steel. So they looked nice. And somebody busted in through the, the window while it was vacant and stole all my, uh, stainless steel appliances they went in through the window but they came out through the front door but instead of unlocking the front door they basically just kicked it down from the inside out and then the how the porch was set up it was like a nice outside porch with like a, a wooden staircase down with like a wooden uh, banister and railings that i redid and i guess they were having trouble getting the fridge it was like a big double door 
uh, fridge and they're having trouble getting it down the stairs and completely tore up my, uh, my railing as well. Um, so they kind of made a mess, scratch up my floors. Cause I had like new wood floors. Like I said, oh. I, I probably put a little bit too much into it. Um, but they basically wrecked the whole thing. Um, but I was covered oh. with insurance. So I had a $2,500 deductible. Um, <clears throat> I, I had the adjuster go out. Um, he was great. He came out really quickly. Maybe came out within a week, um, wrote up a bid for about like 15,000 that they were able to get me. Um, so all in all, I think insurance cut me a check for about 12,500. And I paid my guys, you know, less than 10 grand to go fix it up. So okay. um, it ended up being okay. Everything got reimbursed. I got new stainless steel appliances, redid the floors, redid the wood. Um, really wasn't out any money other than the vacancy that I had. Because right. uh, it took about six weeks. Yeah. Um, but other than that, that's probably my, uh, my best deal that also had a couple, you know, a couple tough elements of it. But um, as long as you're set up, you know, in a healthy <laughs> way where you have, insurance and, and yeah. those types of things in place to protect you then you know you, you're you're protected to a certain extent you know yeah absolutely get that insurance get that insurance i was one day away from closing on a really it was probably going to be a, a six-figure flip the deal fell apart at the last minute but i had already the day before i had already uh talked with the insurance agent had it ready to go for the for the next starting the next morning just because of that especially in the dicier neighborhoods I thought I thought you were combining the two deals with uh, on me there. I thought, well, wait a minute, did I did I black out? Because this sounds pretty terrible. But the it ended it ended well. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, that's the thing too. Like I feel like some of the best deals you kind of have tougher things in it, and then some of the better deals or some of the worst deals that I have are like, you know, everything went well. I just you know maybe didn't manage it well or whatever. But um, I would say probably one of my worst deals was my very first one. Um, it was another like flip story, but, um, had a contractor that, um, came out, we were trying to do subcontracting. So we were, we were trying to, um, you know, kind of find our own vendors instead of hiring a general contractor that was going to manage the entire thing. Um, and it was our first project. So for us, we were like, this is great. We're saving money. In reality, we were inexperienced trying to do, you know, a, a job that we weren't ready to do. Um, but we ended up subcontracting everything out. Um, we had a, a essentially a handyman that had a couple guys that worked for him. Uh, he said that, you know, it would be more affordable if we paid him hourly instead of like for a job. So instead of being like, Hey, it's going to be $2,000 for the drywall and labor. It's like, Hey, how about you pay me $25 an hour? And then whenever we're done, then you just pay us. So it made sense, you know, not knowing any better. It made sense at the time. Um, but, you know, obviously he, he probably got, I think we, our total budget for that job was maybe 40 grand in rehab and we got about 25,000 in and very little work was done. And then he bailed and we had to find another contractor who costs about 45,000 to complete the rehab um, on top of the 25,000 we already spent. Yep. Um, so that was kind of, that was, it was good in hindsight, you know, it felt like, you know, it was, it was horrible because our first deal and it's not going well. Um, but in hindsight, I think it was a good lesson to learn first time around because, you know, getting quality people, getting the right people in the right places, um, right. who can do, you know, quality work, who can make it, um, if it's a, if you're selling it either, you know, an FHA VA quality to make it uh, safe and functional, or, you know, if, if it's going to be a long-term rental to make it, um, you know, safe and functional for your tenants and be able to pass a section inspection, that's way more important than the, yeah five, 10 grand that you think you're going to save, um, especially if you're, you know, starting out. It's something that, you know, through, you know, maybe pride and ignorance, I feel like I could handle a little bit better now. Um, but especially starting out, you know, I had no business uh, trying to do all that. I should have just got maybe a little bit better deal, got a little bit better at negotiating and, you know, built in a little bit extra room for me to pay a project manager, me to pay a general contractor. But, yeah, very cool. No, I, I love that deal. And I wanted to make sure I called out like, hey, even when you were doing that foundation work on your first flip, your first quote was $90,000. Some people might have just rolled over and be like, that's it. But you right. asked the second question and the follow up question. I want to make sure the newbies catch on to that. Like you shouldn't never stop at the very first quote. That's why it's so important to get multiple quotes. But you also have to at least negotiate a little bit or at least ask a different question so you can actually understand for yourself what is the work that's actually being done. Because I've had people quote me for electrical for $9,000. And you're like, 
And I said, hey, no, that doesn't even work. And they come back at $4,000. And you're like, what just happened? Just from asking a second question, that's crazy. You went from 90 to 15,000. That's like a, someone's whole year salary. So I don't want people to miss on that point. Um, but let's move on to, the, on to the next part of the conversation where I really want to hear about stories of people that you've been able to help with affordable housing, right? Dylan, I think you're doing something that's a very noble. It's a great business, but we love it because we can also help people at the same time. Do you have any stories of people that you've been able to help buy affordable housing? And similar to what Dane said, like we also want to hear about horror stories because the fear of the unknown is what causes paralysis. And we want to make sure we can highlight those horror stories and hear about how you dealt with them. So Dylan, tell us a good story and then maybe a bad story afterwards. Yeah, um, I almost have, this was from December. So this is maybe five, six weeks ago. Um, and it's like a horror story and a good story kind of mixing the one. But I had um, a furnace that went out during that winter storm that swept across the, the Midwest. Um, it was like negative six in St. Louis. It was down to zero in Cleveland. And a furnace went out like two days after Christmas. And I have home warranties on my property. So they sent somebody out almost immediately. Um, they were going to pay for the entire furnace replacement, which is great. Um, so I, I have home warranties on all my properties for that reason. Um, but just like trying to get the unit to the, the property, it was going to take about 24 hours. Um, so I ended up paying for the hotel uh, for two nights for the tenant because it's this lady. She's a single mother. She has a couple of kids. Paid for her to go get a hotel while it's freezing. Um, then within that 24-hour time period, the pipes ended up bursting in the property mm -hmm. and which which we knew was like definitely a factor but there's only so much you can do you know to kind of help it unless you go there and drain all the lines um but yeah so they ended up bursting and soaking both furnaces um ruining a bunch of stuff um yeah it ended up just being kind of a mess um so we ended up filing an insurance claim they're covering everything they're covering the two furnaces they're covering you know, everything needed. I had a drain uh, that was set up in the basement where everything drained out well. Um, it just kind of drenched everything. Um, you know, we have to replace the pipes. Um, so I'm covered by insurance. I'm covered by home warranty. So there is like risk mitigation there. Um, but then I had another vacancy in a different unit and I was able to relocate the tenant. I was able to refund her a full month's rent um, because insurance, I have, I have uh, loss of rent coverage on my insurance policies as well. So like if something like that happens, I can refund their rent um, and still get covered by the insurance company um, through that vacancy that it takes to get somebody back in that unit for a claim like that. Um, so I ended up refunding her um, her month's rent in December. Um, she was able to then go to one of my vacant units. And then we basically restarted the process through Section 8 to uh, move her voucher from that one property with the, with the broken pipes into uh, the new property. So it filled one of my vacancies. Um, I was still kind of getting paid rent on the backside um, from the insurance claim. And then most importantly, I was able to kind of help her out through a situation where, you know, maybe in those areas, you know, the, the we always think of Section 8 tenants as being kind of hit or miss, like you got to vet them, you got to find the right one. Um, but there's also Section 8 uh, landlords that are hit and miss, who can not always do the right thing in those types of situations. Um, so it was great. You know, she was a good tenant. She was really taking care of the property. So it was nice for, um, you know, me to be able to do that for, her, but also to keep her as a tenant because, um, yeah. you know, I think that's something that can be forgotten whenever you have a, a section eight tenant that's, um, you know, really taking care of your property and doing the right things. And, you know, on the up and up, you want to do everything you can to, to help them out, to continue to encourage them, especially if they have, uh, you know, young kids and things like that. Yeah, that's, that's great. It, that's, uh, good for karma, but also business uh, obvious, for obvious reasons. Once you find good tenants and you, know, you just don't want them to leave. So that, that was, that's tremendous. And, and, you know, we try to do some of the similar things is once we get a property stabilized is, you know, we've done, you know, little uh, Kroger gift cards for people when, when we know that they're struggling and just little things like that. Yeah. If they're, if they're a good person, you know, if they're, a butthead we don't want them there you know uh but you know that's great that that's great uh, good for you and you had mentioned yeah. section eight 
obviously you deal with Section 8. What is your – tell everybody all, all – uh, I don't know how many million uh, listeners we have now, Kent, but tell uh, tell the listeners your experiences – honest, you know, straightforward dealing with Section 8 and, and other government uh, agencies like that? Has it been good? Has it been bad? Maybe share good and bad. <clears throat> yeah. So just to touch on what you said about karma as well, I feel like a lot of people can separate like karma from good business. But I feel like whenever I'm doing the right things, it's also the best for my business as well. Yeah. Very rarely does like taking advantage. You know, I feel like some a small portion of people think that the only way to win in business is by like taking advantage of people or like, you know, really sticking it to them and like getting every penny out of investment. But like the, the return on investment of taking care of people um, that they'll provide to your business, whether it's word of mouth, whether it's paying you rent for, or, you know, via voucher through the next 10 years, like it always comes back. And even if it doesn't pencil out, um, you know, mathematically in your business, like you said, with those Kroger cards, if, you know, you're not going to get any more rent out of them by giving them, you know, helping them out through their, their time of need. But I do think, you know, it it does come back to you tenfold whenever you, whenever you do those sort of things. So I think that's great that that you do that as well. Um, But yeah, I think it's really a mixed bag with the uh, public housing authorities, as well as the the local municipalities. Um, I'm very, like independent. I don't want people telling me what to do. So initially with like having to um, conform to housing inspections, which can seem objective at times they're objective at other times they're subjective. And I really struggled with that in the beginning uh, because, you know, you would, you would walk the unit a couple of times. You'd have one of your people walk the unit, go through the checklist, make sure everything's good. And I remember the first housing authority inspection that I had, they flagged me for like not having caulking <clears throat> on the, the kitchen countertop between like the kitchen countertop and one of the walls. And there's little things like that where I was looking through the sheet. Cause it's my first one. So I'm like, I'm trying to go exactly off of, you know, the, the HUD sheet that has like the, the safe and, and inhabitable conditions or whatever it's titled. But right. um, I was like, where, where is caulking? And just trying to talk to some inspectors, it, it is hit or miss. They're like, listen, this is just what I told you to, to fix and you just need to fix it. And I had a huge problem with that at the beginning. But I think now with the mindset, like if I could go back, I would definitely go into it with the mindset that whatever they say goes and it's totally fine. If they come out and want me to fix something, I should just fix it. And I can save maybe I can like mentally a lot, maybe a thousand dollars per unit, especially first time I'm trying to get it Section 8 approved so that if they flag things that even if I disagree, with, it's totally fine. I'm just going to fix it. And it is what it is. It's just kind of a cost of doing business and it should be fixed for the next time they come through and, and recertify the unit in a year. So um, that was kind of a mindset change that I needed. Um, and then there was kind of hit or miss. There was a, um, that one property that got broken into um, and they stole my, my stainless steel appliances and all that type of stuff. They kicked down the door. But when we called the police, the police came. And um, they basically told me to board up the house and try to like, basically don't go overboard trying to fix it right now because you're probably going to want your insurance adjuster to like come in and look at it, blah, blah, blah. So like basically like try to leave it as much as you can so you can get credit for the damages. So we put the front door like leaning against the porch and it it didn't look bad. Like we definitely had a piece of plywood over the front door because it was completely kicked out and there was like nothing you could possibly do about it unless you like completely reframe it. But we just left this like turquoise front door on the porch, which, you know, we didn't think anything about. Well, we come back to the property a couple days later and there was a code violation on the door. And we're like, what? So we look, cause we're like, oh, maybe it's like the plywood or something. We weren't in a historical area. It wasn't anything like, you know, niche like that. And it basically said that we had debris accumulation <laughs> for having the front door after our home just got broken into <laughs> and they kicked it, you know, they went through the window, they took all our stuff, busted it. Like our, our whole, the front area of our porch was completely busted. Like they could tell we got broken into and we got code violated for it. And they basically said that we had to fix it within like a couple days or they were going to come back and start assessing a fine for it. So naturally I was like, I'm not fixing anything. Yeah. I just got broken into. <laughs> and it was not a fight that I was likely going to win. And they started, so then they came back. They had uh, some obscure code about my fence being too high. 
because I guess it was like two feet too high. They started flagging me for a bunch of stuff. It basically spiraled. And I ended up with 150 grand in fines from the city of Tampa just for like, and my house was the nicest house in the entire neighborhood. It was the nicest house. And I was getting all these fines for like a fence being too tall, my door being on the porch, a bunch of crazy stuff. And it ended up costing me several thousand dollars in legal fees trying to get it removed. And eventually, you know, the city of Tampa, they, they, they were out to get me a little bit, but not like completely. And uh, they ended up waiving all the fines. Um, but it did take me several thousand dollars in legal fees to actually get rid of that. And if I would have just been like, hey, you know, that's totally fine. I'll put the door inside. It would have fixed the whole thing. And I wouldn't have had the whole, you know, never ending battle with the city. Um, but I think, yeah, going back, especially whenever you're dealing with um, a city, a local municipality, state, county, public housing authority, any institution like that, um, if you're going to play the game of real estate, you have to abide by those type of rules. If you're going to play the game of Section 8 rentals, you have to be, you know, buddy, buddy with the PHAs, the public housing authorities, and do what they want you to do. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. just, you know, it's either the, their way or the highway. Um, if you decide to play the game, you need to play by their rules. And that's something that I learned the hard way twice. But, um, you know, that's definitely been my experience. I've had great experiences with inspector that, inspectors that have gone into properties and been like, hey, you know, there's two really small things that we're going to flag you for. But we're just going to, you know, assume you're going to fix these. Like, are you going to fix these in the next week? And I'll be like, yeah. And they'll be like, great. Then we're just going to go ahead and pass you so these people can move in. You know, I've had great inspectors like that. And then I've also had inspectors that were like, you know, flagging me for missing light bulbs, for caulking around the kitchen sink, for just obscure things like that. So it's really hit or miss, but if you're going to play the game, you know, play by the rules. Yeah, I'm so glad. I mean, that's perfect. Uh, everything from my experience, you you touched on. We we had we failed on our first property, which was 20 units, 10 townhomes. The first um, uh, Section 8 inspection failed because the elect- one of the electrical sockets, like this was a total gut job, like down to the studs. This, this unit was nasty. Um, but when it was done, it was it was gorgeous. Um, but one of the electrical outlets was upside down in the living room. They picked up on it and failed us. And I'm like, bro, we could we could just do that right now. No, and it took two, three weeks for them to come back out. Uh, I'm much like you. I don't have problem with um, a very direct uh, slash abrasive, constructive conversation with people. And that was, I'm glad I didn't because I played nice in the sandbox. Oh, thank you so much for catching that. By the way, is there anything else in the future we should look for? And you know, played by their rules and let them know that, yes, look, we fixed it. And by the way, you know, any other properties that we have, what else should we look for? Is there anything new that's not on our punch list like that you referenced? Um, because sometimes, you know, the inspector could just be in a bad mood. Uh, the other thing we ran into was the, the, the Section 8 inspectors knew these properties <clears throat> they knew the former owner and uh, came in guns blazing, ready just to shut the whole damn place down. Wasn't our fault that the last guy was a slumlord, but they knew the properties and they had that scar tissue of like, oh my gosh, there's feces in the basement and mold here and da 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 da. But once we put our stamp on it, that look, we fixed all this. And by the way, here are some more units, and these are an upgrade. And we've started making connections. Then, then just like you said, Dylan, man, it turned into, hey, um, there's no caulking on, on the countertop here. Just make sure you fix it. Send me a picture of it and, and you're good to go. They trusted us and they knew that we were going to do the right thing. And, and that was that's how we got started. Yeah, for sure. So that, that's perfect. Everything you said is, is exactly what we've dealt with um, at one time or another. For sure. I mean, What's funny okay. is in hospitals, they have the outlets upside down because they want out of like the three prong cords, they want like if it comes out a little bit and something hits it, it'll hit the ground instead of hitting one of the uh, oh. the live <laughs> wires. 
So you should have hit him with that. I don't know. I know you're trying to be a peacemaker. But... It wasn't exactly a hospital. Uh, I'm sure somebody died there at one point or another, but uh, <laughs> or was born there. I don't know. <laughs> Probably both. Oh, Dylan, I, I can't. We can't thank you enough for sharing those stories because I think those those lessons are can save someone so much headspace and it prepares people for those conversations so they don't get so down on themselves. Now they can say like, hey, last time I heard from Dylan, he went through this inspection and that's what he went through. So this time I already know what to expect and to get my mind right so that people don't burn hours or even days just stressing over these things and trying to pick fights where you know they might not ever win. So people got to be really conscious of the time that they're spending on these issues where you know, for us, we might be spending like a day or two stressing over these problems when we could have just said, okay, fine, let's just take care of it. And they could have spent a day or two raising capital, buy more properties. Right. So it's really just up an opportunity cost when you, when you pick those fights and you challenge folks on something that might just be very, very minor at the end of the day. And I'm so glad you were able to share that wisdom on the podcast today. Um, Dylan, I don't want to lose sight of, you know, helping people understand like what numbers, what kind of profits can people earn? Do you have numbers besides replacing flips like on a property you have in St. Louis or in Cleveland on how much you bought it for, how much you're renting it, uh, you're renting it out for right now, and it's actually and how much you're cash flowing there? Yeah. So on the average deals I'm buying right now in Cleveland, um, I recently purchased a duplex for fifty five thousand. Um, it needed a little bit of work. I put about ten grand into it. Um, cause I have a good handyman that I basically pay for the materials and then pay him for the labor. Um, so it's kind of like a, a hybrid between, um, doing like an hourly rate that obviously did not work out for me. Um, as well as like, you know, maybe paying a premium for a general contractor, you know, but for a smaller job, it just wasn't quite necessary. Um, so I was all in at about 65,000. Um, I refinance into a long-term loan. Um, so probably for my average, uh, long-term rental, all my PITI will be about, so my, my mortgage, my taxes, and my insurance monthly will be under $700. And then with my rents, my rents are typically around $2,000 for a duplex like that. So like one side will get about ten fifty, the other side I've rented for nine fifty. dollars um, So that's the spread. So I guess my gross cash flow would be roughly $1,300. Um, but what is not included, and this is another thing that I learned very quickly with long-term rentals, um, especially in St. Louis and in Cleveland, is whenever you come down in purchase price, you have to go up in percentage of uh, maintenance and capital expenditure reserves. So I'm, oh, I'm going to make $1,300 a month and I don't. So if you have a property like my Tampa rentals, if it was rented for $2,250, and I was mentally, let's say mentally, I was like, okay, I might spend 100, 200 bucks on, you know, maintenance every single month. And maybe Cleveland, I would also spend 100, 200 dollars, but it's half the rent because I'm only getting 950 instead of 2250. So I'm spending twice the percent of rent towards like routine repairs than what I was spending in Tampa. And then what's also a big, um, I feel like this is the number one thing that gets people, um, especially in a little bit like lower uh, priced markets like Cleveland, um, is that a roof is still a roof. So a roof is still going to cost you the same amount for the most part, I mean, roughly in Cleveland than it will in Tampa, even though you're getting less rent per unit. So I also am very intentional about, um, like if you think a, a a roof is going to cost you 10 grand to replace, then you should divide that roughly by 30 years, um, divide that by 12 months and be like, okay, this is my monthly cost of my roof uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that you have adequate reserves or things like that. Um, there's always things you can do to get around that. Like I was caught um, really low on cash um, and I had to do a roof replacement in St. Louis once. Um, so instead of just like forking over the 10 grand to fix the roof or completely replace it, um, I was able to find a contractor that offered financing and, and it ended up being like 80 bucks a month instead of the full 10 grand, which saved me because I, I basically had the tenants pay for the roof in a way instead of myself. Right. Um, right. But that was something that in hindsight, I should have been saving for. I should have been setting money aside. So like for this duplex, for example, my absolute net um, is about $650 and it has two units. 
Um, so it's about 325 each unit. Um, but that's another, you know, 600 out of the 2000, I pay roughly 700 in my mortgage taxes and insurance, and then roughly another $650 between management, um, between my maintenance re reserves, um, which is for like, Hey, my toilet broke or, uh, my door doesn't close because you know, it is hot and it expanded or whatever those like miscellaneous repairs are. Um, I have another reserves for capital expenditures, which would be like your roofs, your furnaces, things like that. And then I also pay for home warranties on all of my uh, properties, which helps cover the amount between like a hundred dollars to 2,500. So like if I have a 2,500 deductible on my insurance, then hypothetically anything that happens to the property that would cause above 2,500 in damages, like a break in or pipes bursting, file the insurance claim. But then there's kind of this no man's land of like a hundred to 2,500 kind of hurts to have like, you know, a, a massive furnace repair that costs a thousand dollars. So I get home warranties. Um, and then if my furnace breaks down, I call them, I pay my service fee, which is about a hundred bucks. And then they come out and get it working again. If they have to replace it, then they replace it. Um, which comes in handy. I had a refrigerator that broke down, call them. They uh, sent somebody out and they couldn't fix it. So they are paying for replacement. So they're paying me like 650 bucks and then I'm going to go get my own fridge. So those types of things save you for those, that, that middle ground as well. But I try to be as generous as possible, putting money aside towards maintenance and, and long-term repairs. Cause I think that's how um, a lot of people that at least I buy properties from who get behind on maintenance because they don't account for it. And they think, you know, whatever their rent minus mortgage tax and insurance is their cash flow, and it can come back and get them. So about six fifty a month is, is what <laughs> is the I need thing. to find out who your home, uh, home warranty company is. Cause I've had terrible experience with them. So maybe it works in your really? market. That's really, really cool. Um, but I want to make sure I emphasize the point that you are now setting aside about $650 of $2,000 rent. That's like, that's over 30%. Sometimes when people listen to other podcasts, they will be like, Oh no, I heard in this podcast is going to be 8% of my rent, but they forget to account exactly for you to talk about a roof is the same in Cleveland versus Tampa. There needs to be a fixed amount. So people need to make sure they understand the market, what their expenses are and set aside the amount appropriately. So they never get caught uh, with a really, really, really big expense. Luckily for you, that's a great idea. Finding a contract that will finance a repair so that your tenants move uh, takes care of it. That's amazing. Cause I think you just removed another fear for some of the listeners that are talking to it. Uh, Dan, mm -hmm. you got anything to add there? No, I, no, I think that's great. That was a little bit of learning on the, on the job that you did. You know, we, we have, um, underwriting templates that that have all the my my brother jared i i think he it's his hobby some people you know work out some people whittle wood he he puts together uh, excel spreadsheets with the formula calculations so that's that was one thing that saved us but the one thing i was going to ask is you know we're very conservative on things like, exactly like that it's, you know save 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 <clears throat> Do you have an emergency fund, so to so speak, set aside um, in case something like COVID happens or mass vacancies hit where you're not where you don't have tenants renting out your properties? Do you have, you know, an emergency fund of three months, six months set aside to cover you for your mortgage um, and, and, you know, fixed and variable expenses? Yeah, I think that's what's tough, especially when you're in the investment space to try to weigh the pros and cons versus having large reserves versus like putting everything towards future investments to increase your income, increase you know your assets, all that. So that's been something that I've gone back and forth on. I don't think it's necessarily like a stance to be chosen, but more of a, a dichotomy to be balanced. You know, there's somewhere in the middle that you could fall. Um, so for me, what I do is I try to, whenever I run numbers on properties um, or project cash flow, I try not to be conservative. I try to be as realistic as possible. So I try to act like it's like the price is right. And I'm trying to get as close to whatever the expense or the income or whatever it is as possible. Um, because um, especially as, you know, because, you know, Dane, you have a lot of units. Um, the larger you get, the closer you get to that number. So yeah. if you have one property, then I would say be a lot more conservative than aggressive when you're investing. Because if you have one tenant that leaves, or let's say 
they start having, you know, family issues. There's police are getting called to the house, you know, not even a rent collection problem. Because let's say you have a fully subsidized Section 8 tenant, you think like behavior, behavioral issues, police are getting called and you have to start evicting, then a hundred percent of your income just left. Right, right. So I would say the smaller the portfolio, the more you need to be conscious about um, reserves versus the larger you can start getting pretty precise and you start having just naturally more reserves, <laughs> you know, from planning it like that. Um, for me, I do not account for extended vacancies. Um, just because there's such a large waiting list um, for Section 8 in Cleveland and in St. Louis. Sure. Um, the majority of areas in the country, it's, it's that way. So I just don't factor that as a realistic possibility just through the, the long wait list. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to collection, none of my current tenants pay a portion of their rents. So they're 100% subsidized. So I also don't account for collection <laughs> issues because... Yeah. That's great. The housing authorities pay on on time. And then what I do account for is repairs because my ability to make the income depends on my ability to pass the section eight inspection to mm -hmm. fix mm -hmm. the property when there's a burst pipe. That's kind of where the, the jeopardy in that rental income comes from is the condition of the property over um, you know, the perceived risk of the extended vacancy, even though that right. is technically a possibility. Um, so I do have reserves. I have about a thousand dollars per uh, reinspection. So in my mind, I'm just going to assume I get flagged for something, you know, a tenant accidentally puts a hole in the wall, doesn't tell me, whatever it may be, there's probably going to be something flagged and I want to fix it as fast as possible. So I have a little bit of a war chest there. And then I try to have just as a whole company, um, to have a good amount of reserves to be able to withstand any sort of break-in, burst pipe, anything like that, to kind of keep the ball rolling before insurance comes in and kicks in their check. So I'm yeah. not super conservative when it comes to um, the possibility of losing the income, but I am <laughs> really conservative when it comes to property maintenance because that would cause me to lose the income. Yeah. So that's kind of how I, I view that. Well, you're really getting your... Yeah, it's it's a it's a little bit different of a of a world, um, uh, but you've mitigated the risk. I think really really well. Home warranty, you're setting aside the money. You don't necessarily have to worry about um, finding a tenant if somebody gets evicted because of the wait list, which is fantastic. And the fact that 100% is paid by Section Eight, you know that that was. I think Kent, we talked about that. Our the first podcast where we were on, we had, I think at that point, 20 or 40 units. When COVID hit, half of those were guaranteed rents. So my colleagues, some of them who weren't as conservative with, with uh, emergency fund savings uh, and, and detested affordable housing, Section 8, they were kind of pulling out their hair because people were turning in keys and walking away and they had no income coming in. But you've got that mitigated you know really nicely so yeah well done well done on that for sure love it thank so you. dylan we're gonna have to wrap up the show but we want to take the time to just thank you for what you do without people like you i always tell the guests on here like i would have never had a stable home kind of grow up in affordable housing so thank you thank you thank you for what you do we need more people like you in this world um if people want to reach out to you to learn more about you where can people actually get in contact with you dylan yeah so the best way to contact me is probably my email so it's my first name, Dylan at Eversoul Group, G R O U P dot com. So that's the best way to get uh, in contact with me. Um, if you have any questions, um, anything you want to run by me, um, I am, you know, I try to be an open book. I'm still on this journey, you know, trying to grow my portfolio and learning as I go. But if there's anything that you think I could help with, you know, I'd, I'd be more than glad to help. Love it. Well, Dylan, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Uh, we really appreciate it. Hopefully we'll have you back on to the show to talk about your next part of your journey. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks Dane, for having thank me. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate man. it. Hey, Dylan, move that portfolio down to Columbus with us. <laughs> All right. <laughs>